Good evening. Uh, we're in between uh, books of the Bible, in between. We just finished Exodus, and we'll be going into Leviticus. But today, I'm going to answer a question that was asked by a fella. He says, hello, I'm curious as to what your take is biblically on breeding unclean animals. I have a friend who says we shouldn't, that God doesn't want us multiplying horses. So that applies to other unclean animals also. I see here you breed dogs, as do I. And Job had many donkeys. Would appreciate your take on it. Well, thank you for the question. And... I encourage everybody to do their own study on this, um, just as I did my own study on it. Starting with God's creation, okay? God made all things, okay? He created all the animals, and he created them all with a purpose, and with an ongoing purpose. And why do I say that? Because he made them to where they could reproduce. He gave them the ability with their seed in themselves to reproduce. And that means to multiply. Okay. When the flood came, that they were taken on board as well, clean and unclean animals. Why more clean animals? Because there was going to be sacrifices. As soon as Noah got off the ark, he built an altar and started sacrificing clean animals to God. And when it's talking about unclean, it's talking about for sacrifices and for food, okay? We're not, to, we're not to sacrifice unclean animals to God, and we're not to not to have them for food. That's, that's what he had to say about that. So, But in other ways, how are they unclean? See, they have a purpose. God created the horse. God created the dog. God created the turtle, the snake, everything. And I think one thing we want, we want to think of right away is, first off, my father made these things with a purpose. And look at the diversity in these animals. Have you ever stopped to think about the diversity in a zebra, then a parrot, then a, a dolphin, and then a turtle, and then, a, you know, you just name it, fill in the blank. There's such diversity. He created all these Wonderful things. So I, I think we first better be careful about looking down. We do this with people too. People look so unclean. People, you know. I live in an area where there's Amish, and the Amish on one side of the road is the clean Amish, and the Amish on the other side of the road is the dirty Amish on this highway. And it, it's ridiculous. It's a matter of a person's heart and mind whether they're clean or not, whether they're defiled or not before God, not not what side of the highway they live on. Okay? I thank God for that he made all the things that he made. At the same time, I don't eat snake, and I don't eat dog and these kind of things, but I'm going to tell you something. It's been shown before in the Bible, where people ate their own children when they were under siege and they had no food. Now, that's that's downright a bad situation. And it said that a donkey or a mule's head was sold for quite a bit. And that was an unclean animal, but they were eating it. I'm going to tell you right now, I, I hope I never get in a spot to where I have to eat certain things. But the day... The days are coming, maybe. You know, and all the all this thing with people eating clean or unclean, we should eat clean. We should eat what God says is food that's never changed. And they've distorted scriptures to act like they have. We should eat what God says is food. But how many of us have ate all kinds of other things before we knew that? So we need to have patience with people. We need to have mercy with people. And we also need to let people... Figure things out for themselves. Because until a person studies it and figures out and God reveals things to them, sometimes they're not going to be ready to do it. And you can't just be pushing on them about things. If my family didn't have nothing to eat, 
Would we eat a dog or a cat or a rabbit? Yeah, we would. Do I, do we want to eat that or do we want to write? No, we don't because it's not food. But we're going to do what we got to do to stay alive too. These things have purposes that he made even though it wasn't food. Let's look at look at Abraham a minute. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what they had and how God multiplied to them, including camels and donkeys. He had all these things, huge amounts of them. And uh, if you read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you see that God multiplied to them. God blessed Abraham. Abraham told uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, you're not going to you're not going to say that you made me rich. God's the one that made him rich. And he had all kinds of things that would be unclean animals, but he wasn't planning on eating them. And this is really the the problem with the misunderstanding about the person who shouldn't breed uh, unclean animals because of the multiplying of horses. God told them that he was their king, but they didn't want to be a king. They didn't want him to be their king. They wanted a king like the other nations. They were supposed to be the leader of all nations and point the way of God's ways and his blessings, but instead they wanted to be like the other nations. What did the other nations have? They had a king. And what did they do? They went out to battle. I think I'd rather have God going out to battle for me than some man somewhere. So they got it. They got their king, and then he set some ground rules. But he told Samuel, they, "Don't worry, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They rejected me from being king and ruler over them." And that's what they did when they wanted to be like the nations. Big mistake. But moving on, God in His great mercy and patience, He let somebody set some ground rules, and He told them that that a king is not supposed to multiply horses. And he's not supposed to multiply wives and so on. And what does he what is he doing here? Let's look at wives for a minute. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth and everything, and he told the, them to be fruitful and multiply. If there was ever a time to get that moving, it would have been then. And did he give Adam more than one wife? No. He made one man and one woman right there. And then, matter of fact, the first time we see somebody with more than one wife is in Cain's line. Remember Adam and Zilla? Remember this? Okay. And and that's not the line to follow. And then you go on to the flood, okay? And what do you have? You have Noah and his wife, and he ha- you have his three sons. And each one of them had a wife. There was eight people in all that got on that ark. And all the people on the earth right now are from that. And that's fact, whether you believe it or not. Now, he could have gave them all multiple wives. That's not God's way. It's not what he did. That's not how he chose. There's another time to repopulate and redo it because everybody else was dead. But he didn't do it. Then what do you have? You go on, and you have the leadership. When you're talking about what, who should be a bishop and who should be a leader, leader in all this in the fellowship, he says the husband of but one wife. You see this? That's the leadership. Why? Because that's an example to everybody else. So... Why did he say this? Don't multiply wives to yourself. Because this is not my original plan. This is not the way I want it to be. And people will look to you like you are the standard. A king is an example. People follow the king. Well, he didn't listen to this. Solomon took about a thousand of them all in all, right? Well, that was going against what God had said about what a king should do, isn't it? He also said, don't multiply horses to yourself. Now, one thing must be clear right now is Solomon wasn't multiplying horses to himself for food. 
It's not that people haven't ate horses in, in times past, because they have. Is it clean and is it food to us? No, it is not. But this is not what King Solomon was doing. He was multiplying these horses because of military strength. People feared the horse and the chariot. And it says in the scripture, some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we trust in Jehovah our God. And that's what he wanted them to do was trust in him. Do you remember when they crossed the Red Sea, they didn't have horses and chariots. They may have some carts and some things that they got from the Egyptians, but remember the Egyptian army followed them, their horses and chariots? And who was overthrown in the sea? It wasn't the Hebrew children. It was the Egyptians with their horses and chariots. Why? Because their king was fighting for them. God Almighty was fighting for them, and he overthrew them in the sea, showing that no horse and chariot is more powerful than he is. But see, they changed over for this, and they wanted, they wanted a king that they could see go out and fight for them. They wanted to have a king stand in a horse and chariot. See, so he multiplied these horses. He didn't do it for food. That's where it's unclean. God wasn't saying don't multiply horses because you're going to eat all the horses. He was saying don't multiply horses because you're going to trust in these horses. You're going to trust in this. Don't be like the other nations. I will fight for you. Even right now, Israel trusts in their iron dome so much that, that rejects and destroys those missiles that are shot their way. You know, it's okay. Good, they have it. That's fine. But it's not what keeps them safe. And some of them know that. I'm not saying they don't know that. But some of them are trusting in that Iron Dome. And there's people that want the plans because they say they want their iron, own Iron Dome. I don't believe that. I think that they want the, the way it works so they can find out why it can deflect their missiles so that they can find a way around it so they can shoot missiles and they won't be able to be protected. Because every nation is going to go against Israel. That's what the scriptures teach. But when they do, and the Iron Dome doesn't protect them, the one who has always been their king and always been their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will come to their defense. And he will save them. Now people don't even have the horses and chariots. They got the tanks and they got missiles and they got, oh, so much military stuff. You know, China's all the time has their showing their military strength and how many they got and God is gonna deal with everyone. He's gonna give us all a good spanking when this thing's over with. He's gonna sort everything out. And he's gonna tell everybody what's gonna be. And that's what we're waiting for, and it's gonna happen. Um, how many did Abraham have? A bunch. I mean, I could give you the scripture for it, but we got a lot to go through. Numbers 31. I mean, basically, this fellow that asked me the question, he basically nailed it by saying Job had many donkeys. Yeah, and, and the thing with Job is he had he had a certain amount, which was huge. Well, we'll, we'll read it. We'll just read it. Because that really... It's the end of discussion, really, right there. Because this person is telling this guy that God doesn't want us to multiply horses and, uh, and other unclean things to ourselves. And uh, so let's just go there. Yeah, I'm turning pages. It takes me a minute. There was a man in the land of Uz. This is uh, chapter 1 of Job whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, and five hundred yoke of oxen, and five hundred she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Okay? God says in a little bit here, 
He's got nobody else like him. He calls him a servant. He's blessed him. You don't just get blessed like this. God blessed him. And here he's got 500 female donkeys, okay? And the, and the Hebrew word for that is atan. And for the male donkey, it's hamor, okay? So he's got all these. And he's got three thousand camels. Camels aren't a clean, aren't aren't food. They're not they're not designed for food. Designed for a lot of good things. God knows what he's doing. He designed all these things for with a purpose. So here he has all these. And then he goes through quite a trial. And at the end of it, and we'll go to uh Job forty two. Turn the pages. I'm not a very fast page turner. Okay, verse 7. And it was so that after Jehovah had spoken these words unto Job, Jehovah said to Eliaphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. And for him uh, will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. We have to be careful what we speak about God. So Eliaphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, went and did according as Jehovah commanded them. Jehovah also accepted Job, and Jehovah turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had. Now, right here it says that God himself multiplied to Job twice what he had. You understand? And, this, and the word says, or, and this guy says, I have a friend who says we shouldn't, that God doesn't want us multiplying horses so that applies to other unclean stock as well. All right here we see that the donkeys and the camels would have been unclean for food. And we see that God multiplied to Job and doubled it. So what does it say? We'll keep reading. Then there came unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that Jehovah had brought upon him. And every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So Jehovah blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep. Remember, he only had 7,000, which is plenty. And 6,000 camels. Remember, he had 3,000. And 1,000 yoke of oxen. And 1,000 she-donkeys. She-asses. See? see this? It says there was nobody on earth like him. And he had all of this, didn't he? But the thing about Job is, remember the book of Job and he says, what I feared has come upon me. You know why? Because Job didn't trust in all his riches. That's what, that's what God was against with the, all the horses was he didn't want them to trust in it. He's the one that keeps him safe in battle. And he, and it's like that in anything. He wants us to know he's the one that provides for us. And God doesn't owe us anything. And Job knew that. That's why he said what I feared had come upon me. Because he knew that no matter if he'd done what was right, and he loved God and everything else, that God didn't have to, he could take it any time he wants. He said, naked I came in this world, and naked I go out. He said, God has given and God has taken away. Blessed be the name of Jehovah. I mean, he, he knew that God didn't owe him anything. And that God gave it and God could take it any time. He didn't trust in those things. And he knew no matter how much he trusted God, that God could bring him through whatever he wanted to bring him through. And that's why the enemy, Satan went after him because he wanted him bad because he kept continually being a shining light for everybody to know God's goodness. And God allowed him to do it.
What a test for the man to go through. Job is such a remarkable man. Okay, so right there really is the end of the discussion because God multiplied these things. And so that at least takes care of the unclean stock. What about horses? Well, Rabbi he said it wasn't because of food. We already explained that, I think, too. So, anyways, we'll keep on going a little bit. In Numbers 31, they're taking the spoil. And, and God told them to multiply it to themselves. He didn't say to eat the unclean animals. He said to multiply it to themselves. And it's the same thing in Chronicles with spoils taken in war. And you can look it up. Look up Numbers 31. So, let's talk about horses again. You know, when Messiah rode into Jerusalem, he rode in on a donkey. Donkey's colt, actually. Would have been unclean for food, but not unclean to ride on. See, that's that's the that's the thing. God made these things for transportation and to help carry our load. But now because people got Chevy trucks and Ford trucks and, and they got all of this, dump trailers, why well, they don't think about this in this way anymore. I'm going to tell you right now, they take everybody's tr uh, transportation away and they're on foot and everybody's going to be glad to have a donkey or two. Everybody's going to wish they had a horse or a, or a cart for the horse to pull or a buggy to ride on. I'll tell you another thing. In the last in the last time when he comes back, he's going to be riding on a white horse when he goes into the battle. And it says on that horse, well, let me read it. In that day, this is Zechariah 14, 20. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto Jehovah. And in Jehovah's house shall be like the bulls before the altar. Now, He's going to be on a horse, and on a horse it says on the bells, Holiness unto Jehovah. Now I want to say this. He doesn't need the horse to win the battle. It says he will overcome with the brightness of his coming. And just, just he can speak it. So it's not, he doesn't trust in the horse. He's the one that made it. Horses, horses trust in him. At least they should. It doesn't say that he's coming back on in a Chevy pickup, even though I like Chevy over Ford. It doesn't say that he's doing that. We're still in Bible times right now. God made everything for a reason. And it, and let me say this. What he made was good. When he made the horse, when he made the mule, the donkey, the oxen, whatever it is you're out there working with in the field, when that horse and that man both get old, they both have offspring, their own children from their own bodies. That will take up and continue the work of the ground and the work that's to be done, whether something's to be hauled or, or not. When they go to the bathroom, whether it's number one or number two, just like the man, it fertilizes the ground. Have you ever seen a baby Chevy truck? And don't tell me about matchbox cars. I'm not talking about that. How about a baby tractor? Baby John Deere, isn't that cute? It, there ain't one. They do not have children they do not have fruit from their own body this is our creation not god's you understand when it when it goes off it puts off fumes that is called pollution it don't pee it don't poop think about that a minute think about that you cannot how many junkyards you know that semi junkyards tractor junkyards car and truck drive yards how much pollution do they make after they're recycling them too? Not an animal or a person. They go into the ground and it all breaks down because we come from the dust of the ground. We're full of minerals and those minerals all go back into the ground. You can't improve upon God's design. And he says to go back to the old paths. What's the old paths? Everybody is using animals for transportation or they're just walking on their feet. That's the facts, people. And let me tell you this. Whoever you are out there, like the person that asked this question or the person that was giving him the time about it, or maybe he wasn't, I don't know, but he said that he was wrong for doing this or that, I guarantee you that they use transportation in one way or another. 
Our mail used to get somewhere by horseback called the Pony Express. People came out to this country and settled the West on Conestoga wagons pulled by horses, oxen, mules, donkeys, and you name it. Okay? And I'm going to tell you another thing. Anybody out there that didn't have their car or truck right now and had a yoke of oxen or they had a couple of donkeys, they better wish they could reproduce because after that, that one dies, they're done. They're done. And then they got to go buy one off somebody else that says, yes, it's okay to breed animals and have a baby donkey and have a baby horse and have a baby camel. Think about it. If you were in the jungles, where would you want? I think I'll take an elephant. How about in the desert? I think a camel would be good. How about on the, you name it, you know what I mean. You know what I'm saying. This is what God made, and he made it to continue on to multiply. And if you don't like somebody that multiplies, oh, donkeys or horses, then I guess that you don't like a, a car salesman then because he's got a lot of cars on that lot that took the place of them horses. Do you have a problem with that person? He's more unclean and unbiblical than the person that has horses or donkeys or mules or camels. He is. And how many people are trying to hoard horses today so they can have military strength and think they're going to whoop everybody? It ain't happening. There might be some people that still have, that their military might have some of that. But look at the militaries of today. What wrecking machines they are. And he said for us all to love one another. And look at it. At the time, horses was faster than then these other things, and that was the that was one of the things of choice for for a military. Some people had donkey, or some people had rode elephants in their war and military deals, and some people had uh, camels in their military deals. But uh, the the horse was one of the favorite things because it was faster. One other thing about is that God has remember the the prophet said was with somebody and he said, oh, that, look, all these people, they've all gathered around. And he said, don't be afraid. And he asked God to open his eyes, open that guy's eyes. And then he could see all the chariots, the horses and chariots of fire, the armies of God all around. And he said, they that are with us are more than they that are with them. <laughs> and then there's a scripture I like. It says, um, the angels of God encamp around those who trust in him. So when you trust in him, know that the angel armies are around you. Just because you can't see the horse and the chariot of fire doesn't mean it ain't there. Remember, that's what come down and got Elijah and carried him off. He went out in a blaze of glory, didn't he? So, okay, just because it's not unclean, just because it's unclean for food doesn't mean it doesn't have a purpose. Let's go back to that a little bit. Let's go past the camels and the horses and the donkeys and the mules. Think about a cat. Cat eats mice. We got a dog, and and she's our varmint dog. She she uh, she'll get a rat or a mouse or whatever, and she keeps that kind of stuff cleaned up around here so it doesn't get our other our other livestock or anything. Uh, let's take a blind person. Sure, they shouldn't they have a person right there with them to help them uh, go through life. Yeah, they should. But the sad truth is, people are alone today. They've sent their kids away to public school, to college, to everything else. And there's a lot of people who don't have anybody. They've been taught that having children is not the right idea. And some of them don't have children. Some of them couldn't have children. But there's people out there blind. Now, it's best thing if you got somebody with you. But if you don't got nobody with you, why is it bad to have a, have a, um, a dog that can help a blind person get around? Why is that wrong? to breed and train a dog to do that. I don't think that it is. You know, there's been unclean animals that have rescued people. And there's all kinds of stories, and I can't go to, into all of them. Another thing it talks about is redeem the firstborn of a donkey in Exodus 13, 13. Whenever something breaks forth the womb, a male, you have to redeem it or give it to God. Every first lamb of a donkey that shall redeem with a lamb, and if thou will not redeem it, then thou shalt break its neck. So you can redeem it with a lamb. 
So you got donkeys, you're breeding donkeys, just like it's fine. And yes, they're an unclean animal for food, but not unclean other than that. And so you can switch it out for a lamb and offer the lamb. Now why would he bother with that if we're just not to breed? See, I think people are getting mixed up with, with taking a scripture and then going against the rest of scripture. God doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't multiply Job and then tell us not to multiply. And like I said, I already explained about the horses. I'm going to look around and see what else I got that I was going to say. Okay, we, uh, we're we going to start raising some rabbits. They're unclean. I'm not going to eat them, but I'm going to feed them to my dogs. Why? Because it's it's something that I don't have to go to the store and buy. Besides, I try to buy the best dog food I can. We've researched it. We, we, we believe in taking care of our animals person here that gave me the question says that he breed, he's a dog breeder i don't know what he what dogs he breeds uh, i don't know if he's got one breed or different breeds i don't know how many he has i don't know anything about that what i know is we breed english shepherds they're the old farm collie and the reason i do it's not for the money the reason i do it is because i believe in the purpose of this dog i truly do i have i have one male and I have one female that is breedable, and the other female, she had some trouble, so she's not. We're not breeding her anymore, but we keep her and let her kind of put her out to pasture. So I mean, she gets to stay here and be fed and loved on and everything. And because she's only unclean for food, she's not unclean otherwise. She's she's uh, been a good dog. She still is, and she's our varmint dog. And you know, she would lay on the back porch. And she would stay there, and it don't matter if it rains or not. And if anybody tried to come in and harm our family, I believe she'd give her life for us. I do. Talks in the scriptures about how the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. A lot of times it's talking about dogs in there. It's also talking about the the Gentile nations or the unbeliever, Okay. God made dogs with a purpose. And I've, I've seen our male dog take my dad's cattle in a 30-acre pasture out of bushes and up a creek and bring them up the hill to the pen. And it was a beautiful thing to see. It was a good help. Now, is, man, is dogs man's best friend? No, God is man's best friend. And probably after that, his wife. But a dog is a good helper for the family on the farm and the ranch or whatever you want to call it, the homestead or the mashav or whatever you want to say there. And they're good for hunting. They're good for varmints. And I talked about the eye seeing dog. And there's some that will jump in water and they can do things. There's some that can smell out drugs and these kind of things. There's some that can smell and tell when you're about ready to have a seizure. And that's helpful to people. Dogs are a, another one of God's creations, and he did it with a purpose. And I think that we need to appreciate that and thank him for it. Not to make so many things seem so much dirty or worthless. Our Father made this. So, you know, I rode a camel before. Kind of uncomfortable, I thought, but in the desert, that's that's what they have. And, uh, I mean, you're just looking at these different animals and what they do. Trying to see what else. Like I say, with the rabbits, that's going to be to feed our feed our dogs. And then when we butcher uh, cattle for ourselves, there's sometimes some of the excess fat and stuff we give them. That helps with the feeding of the rabbits because there's a thing called rabbit starvation, just eating that lean meat and you don't get enough fat, which we feed them other things too, and they do really well. The dog food that we get, we get at Tractor Supply, and it's called uh, For Health. And it's been good. We've tried other things, and they didn't do as well on it. One thing I'd like to say is, if if you're running a puppy mill, and you're just doing it for the money, think about these animals and what you're doing. Are they going to spend all day just in a crate somewhere? Do you realize that we're to take care of our animals? And it says the the righteous man regards the life of his beast but the tender mercies of the crew are wicked. So even when a, a cruel person is is doing its best, they're still they're still cruel. 
But when a righteous man, he regards life as a beast. He takes care of them. And so we take care of our dogs, and we place them with people, and we're very careful about that, of who, where they're going. And will they meet the needs of these people? And these, these dogs usually are going to farms and ranch in the country. Some of them are going into town to people that flat out are lonely because they ain't got no family around. And they're very smart dogs. I've seen dogs that run around the house ten times and won't stop to even, you know, they, 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 it's like the, the good sense has been bred out of them. These dogs aren't like that. These dogs are smart dogs. And this is why I wanted to, I wanted to get this dog and, and promote this dog because of things that I'd heard about the old people. And they'd, think of, they'd hear the term English Shepherd, Old Farm Collie, and their face would light up because they remembered it from when they were kids and how they'd send whatever the dog's name might be out to go get the cows because it was time for milking and she'd go out and get them and they'd come up. And then... Another person talked about how there was this cow that took out after him. And if it wouldn't have been for his dog, that dog took the brunt of it. And, and, you know, so we take care of our animals. So if you're running a puppy mill and you're just doing it for money, I think it's not the right thing at all. And what is the purpose of what you're doing? Um, there's a lot of people who pay a lot of money for a lot of things out there. But that doesn't, that doesn't make it a good reason. Is what you're selling worth promoting, and is it for the service of mankind? Is it is it going to bring glory to God and his kingdom? Is it going to be along with the purpose that God made for that animal in the first place? These things are all important questions. Now, I don't know anything about the person that sent this. He says he's a dog breeder. That's all I know. I don't know anything else. But if you are, take care of your animals out there. You know, we're being stewards of them just like anything else. Now, now, like there's, I know with horses and cat, horses and dogs, there's so much about them with Hollywood and what they've done. Okay, don't even really want to go into all that, but just a lot of a lot of things that ain't even any good. But horses and dogs, horses and dogs, and um, oh, where was I going with that? Anyways, we're not all into that kind of thing. But I always have to remember that God made these things and he made them with a purpose and we need to honor that purpose. And and I believe we do that with our dogs and I believe they're worth promoting and that that people that it's a benefit to people. And well one little girl she was scared of dogs because she has a couple incidents with dogs. And we, she got, they got a dog off of us, and that that dog loved that little girl, and and she overcame her fear through this dog from us. And now they, she doesn't have that problem no more. And she, you know, people don't need to be walking around in this fear. And if she ever has an encounter again, that dog from us might be. What shuts that other dog down in case the parent ain't close at the moment? It's just like if you're walking in the woods, and a lot of times the dogs want to go out just a little bit ahead. Well, if they find a snake, it's better they find it than you find it, you know? Um, trying to think of anything else. I know I'm forgetting something, and as soon as I get done here, then I'll think, well, why didn't I say that? Now, one thing I wanted to talk about, too, was... Uh, it says a bridle for a donkey and a rod for the fool. This shows a donkey is sometimes smarter than a fool. That's Proverbs uh, 26.3. Balaam was beating his donkey. He was on his way to curse Israel, remember, and he was on his donkey. And his donkey saw an angel and stopped and wouldn't go through. And Balaam starts beating his donkey while the donkey was trying to save his life. You see? And God allowed that donkey to talk. So, sometimes an unclean donkey can be better than a fool, can it? 
How unclean can we be? How defiled do we allow ourselves to be? That's what we need to think about. I mean, if you look for vehicles and some of the things we've made, you might find it under witty inventions. Where else are you going to find it? You know, we're still in Bible times. See, that's one of the tricks to get us to think that we're not so that we think it's okay. I hope this answers your question. Hope it helps. But you have to make up your own decision about what you believe. And I encourage you to study the word yourself on it. But I believe it's acceptable to totally acceptable and I think that the person's distorting scripture about why not to multiply horses why that scripture is because when you take a scripture and distort it like he did you're going to run into contradictions throughout scripture and that's what's happened and when you don't run into contradictions and it goes all the way across then you know there's something there but this doesn't so And, uh, you know, look at how many horses the chariot Solomon had. He was totally multiplying horses to himself, just as God told him not to do. He totally multiplied wives to himself and led him astray to worship false gods, just as God did not want him to do. And there's a lot of good things he did, too, but those things weren't good. And the next king that came along, uh, the kingdom was divided, and that wasn't good. So, I hope it helped. Have a good one, and stay in the Word.